depending on your time zone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Professor Akhtar Hussain, President-elect of the International Diabetes Federation and the chair of the IDF Education and School Committee. I'm supported with two colleagues from the IDF office, Dr. Samir Pathan and Mr. Phil Riley, who has enormously worked to make this success. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all today's live webinar. We'll spend the next 90 minutes discussing managing CVD risk and type two diabetes beyond the glycemic control. And thank you for taking the time to be here today with us. Today is all about uncovering the latest evidence-based findings on cardiovascular disease, renal disease, and critical diabetes management in CKD guidelines. We will be addressing the following topics. Firstly, we'll discuss the relationship between type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Then we look into the influence of renal risk in type two diabetes. Before our last speaker will give an overview of critical diabetes management in CKD guidelines. With us today, we have distinguished panel of leading experts in their respective fields. Welcome Professor Nabit Sattar from UK, Professor per, per Henry Group from Finland, and Professor Kamlesh Kunti, United Kingdom. We are honored that you could have be here today to share your vision and insight into the managing CVD and renal risk in type two diabetes beyond glycemic control. Before we get, get started, I'll go through some housekeeping to help you interact with our speakers. We'll be running live question and answer sessions at the end of the webinar. So we have enabled our open chat feature. If you have any question for our speakers, just pop them into the chat and this will be shared with our speakers at the end of the session. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we'll be sending around the on-demand recording once available. The webinar recording will also be available via the IDF website and the IDF School of Diabetes platform. For those you just join us, joining us, welcome, and I wish you an excellent session. Let's get straight into the content, Professor Sattar, Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hussain. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, I think you can. So um, I'm going to give you the sort of cardiovascular links to diabetes and recent insights as, as, as the chairman had said. Um, I'm from Glasgow and uh, Contrary to beliefs, the sun does sometimes shine in Glasgow. In fact, um, it's bright today. I can see blue sky in Glasgow. So it's, uh, it's an unusual day. These are my disclosures. So th things I think um, that I think we've learned over the last few years are the following. You need to think about stretch our minds. Diabetes associated cardiovascular risk, at least in high income countries are coming down. I'm not so sure what's happening around the rest of the world. I suspect they're in different periods of flux. Um, certainly better treatments means less non-fatal cardiovascular disease, perhaps fatal, but the risks do remain higher than people without diabetes. And we know that clearly because that's why we still have a, you know, a significant proportion of our patients with cardiovascular disease have diabetes. Um, as, as ischemic heart disease related factors are coming down, relatively more other outcomes are coming to the fore, such as heart failure, uh, we are seeing proportionally more chronic kidney disease, which uh, uh, Professor Group is going to talk about. Um, so, and I think the conclusions we've reached, and we know this, and you, we all know this, and, but it's been reminded even more forcefully based on the recent trials, is that glucose lowering per se is not the only answer to reducing cardiovascular risk. In fact, we know that the disease is multifactorial, and therefore we need to think about other factors. The, the reason I think we've concentrated perhaps too much on glucose it's because the disease itself is defined by glucose levels. There are other mechanisms that operate behind the scenes to cause cardiovascular risk, which I don't think we fully understood. And I think some of the new drug trials have helped us start to look at this again. And therefore, specific drug mechanisms for diabetes drugs, how they actually lower glucose or the mechanisms of their actions, um, 
matters to cardiovascular risk in ways that we did not expect. Start from the beginning. Uh, let me remind you that diabetes on average doubles cardiovascular risk. This is a paper that we published back in 2010. Coronary heart disease almost exactly doubling people with diabetes compared to those without uh, for future outcomes. Um, slightly more fatal disease, less non-fatal disease, and again, more ischemic stroke and other vascular deaths. But that's on average. I think at the point of diagnosis, the risk is somewhat less. After 10 years, the risk is somewhat higher. But if you take the whole diabetes populations in a number of countries, and this was a meta-analysis of multiple cohorts, roughly double. The good news is, of course, we know that certainly in high-income countries, I'd be interested to know what the, the, issue, the, the pattern is in uh, Asia and other parts of the world. Um, so this is from data from America, from Ed Gregg. The MI rates in America over two decades had fallen by almost threefold in people with diabetes, stroke perhaps by twofold. Um, and you can see the kind of trends. But that was up to 2010. Why? Well, because certainly in the States, um, there was large reductions in smoking and, and um, from the 70s and 80s onwards. There were significant improvements in blood pressure with antihypertensives coming to the fore in the 80s and 90s. And then more towards 2000 statins after studies like CARDS, HPS, um, and various other studies, large reductions in lipid levels in people with diabetes, more so than the average population. And only moderate improvements in glucose started to manifest after UK PDS and more moderate improvements beyond the 2000s. When we did an analysis in the Turnbull and the meta-analysis of, of intensive glucose trials pretty much came up with the same conclusions that if you treated 200 patients for five years uh, with glycemic drugs, so to lower sugar per se, you prevented roughly three events. But notice you got more benefit if you compared the glucose intensive lowering trials versus statin or blood pressure trials, you would get more benefit. And there is no updated, updated data coming from diabetes from various other groups that you got more benefit by giving them the statin to lower cardiovascular outcomes or blood pressure. And that, again, attests to the fact that the disease is multifactorial. Glucose is the way we diagnose it, but underneath the bonnet, there's lots of other abnormalities like hypertension, dyslipidemia, that we need to address to gain the maximum benefit for our patients. What about eye events? So this was um, um, Sophie Zungas. I led this from the four intensive glucose loading trials. So that's UKPDS, uh, VADT, Advance, and Accord. And when you meta-analyze it for eye events, Oh, sorry, for microvascular events, this is what you saw. And I want you to remember these figures because uh, Professor Group uh, and Kunti are going to talk about the sort of how you prevent kidney events and how new ways. But reducing hemoglobin A1C by 0.9%, at least with the drugs we had prior to 2010 or up to the point of these trials. So that was predominantly metformin, sulfonylurea, insulin predominantly, um, a little bit of glitazone. You the lowering glucose per se lowered kidney events by 20%, so a modest reduction over the course of five years. 30% for eye events, again, modest. There was no, a, a, no a clear benefit on nerve events, but remember these studies were only short, and we do believe that you get benefit on nerve events if you keep sugar down low for one to two, three decades, et cetera. So I think this, this is just probably lack of power because of not enough events and not long enough, but certainly, modest benefits in kidney outcomes. So there is substantial room for improvement in kidney outcomes by other mechanisms beyond sugar. Again, comes back to the multifactorial. So the broad summary, say in 2010, we had lowered cardiovascular events over the last two to three decades and predominantly by a multifactorial lipid, blood pressure, glucose, less smoking. But glucose lowering per se is clearly not the only answer. So, you know, there are other factors. Diabetes risk, while lowered, still remained high compared to the general population. Other conditions came more to the fore, like CKD, heart failure, and peripheral arterial disease. Why did they become more common? I think partly, uh, I'll let Professor Group talk about this, but in some ways, we're keeping people alive a lot longer with preventing premature cardiovascular death. They have more time to develop chronic kidney disease. But equally, I think you know, other than blood pressure and glucose, lipids don't really do much to prevention of chronic kidney disease, maybe slight, um, but there were other mechanisms operating that we didn't fully understand. And my sense also is that the obesity and diabetes, certainly in high income countries, is relevant to heart failure in ways that we didn't fully understand. And I think drivers of heart failure and diabetes are multifaceted. 
Just to go back to this underneath the bonnet concept. Now, this is a paper we published using UK Biobank. I'm not going to go through it in any detail. All I want you to say, look at the right-hand panel. Um, this was done in sort of several hundred thousand people, but we were able to look at the characteristics of people with prediabetes compared to normal glycemia. And in the people who had prediabetes, their absolute cardiovascular risk were double, but when you adjusted for the usual risk factors, it was marginally elevated. That suggests that the glycemia in prediabetes isn't the major risk factor for cardiovascular outcomes. It's not the reason that the risk is double, because if it was, that adjustment would not have led to such an attenuation. The real factors are, and I think predominantly is actually the fact that three units higher body mass index, at least predominantly in white individuals, that's about five, um, 15, three units, yeah, it's about 10, sorry, it's about nine to 10 kilograms of weight extra. Linked to that is high systolic blood pressure in people with prediabetes compared to normal glycemia. Linked to that is a dyslipidemia, particularly characterized by low HDL because of high triglyceride, so ectopic fat. And slightly older, slightly more smokers, but these are the reasons that their absolute cardiovascular risk is elevated. The glycemia at the point of prediabetes adds minimally to cardiovascular risk. It's the things underneath the bonnet. And it, that makes sense. So when they develop diabetes, yes, the sugar starts to accelerate risk. You know, and in absolute terms, it goes up even more. But remember, much of this excess risk <clears throat> was linked to obesity, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia. So that's why we have to tackle blood pressure, dyslipidemia. We don't tackle the BMI, the obesity very well. And that's something I think is a theme that is going to enrich over the next few years, particularly as a result of COVID accelerating obesity levels. And also, perhaps in many parts of the world, people putting on weight. Um, certainly, um, we've seen that rapidly in the UK over the last two, three decades. Um, they've probably seen it to a lesser extent in, in Finland. I think Finland is one of the healthiest countries in the world. Um, but certainly, I don't, and in Asia, people are putting on weight, and there's a greater susceptibility. So guidelines, what does it mean? Treat lipids, absolutely. Blood pressure, absolutely. Smoking, absolutely lifestyle and the usual risk factors. Keep glucose low, but what we've now learned, and I'm gonna show you in the next few slides, specific drugs benefit cardiovascular events well beyond glucose reduction. So it's not, you know, um, what about lower middle income countries? Well, the big gains there, and you know, um, really, if you can get sustainable blood pressure, lipid lowering and metformin from diagnosis, so pick up people early, treat with metformin, um, and other cheap drugs, uh, you know, that really do benefit glucose, but also with sustainable blood pressure and lipid lowering, there is much to gain, substantial to gain, um, but there's a huge unmet need in sustainability of these uh, prescriptions, and there's a huge unmet need in targeting and finding people close to the point of diagnosis. I'm not saying we've got it all right in, the, in, in high income countries, but clearly checking glycemia more regularly does help. And the other big area that this unmet need is, is weight and lifestyle, um, whereas particularly weight loss. I mean, we pay lip service to it. That means we talk about it, but we don't really do well enough. Um, a lot of this evidence was captured in the ESC guidelines for CV prevention. Um, Frank Frisseren was a brilliant uh, lead for this. I was helped in this, and I think it's a good read for the up-to-date evidence base. Okay, the last sort of... Um, actually, we're not doing okay. Um, um, the next half of it really then is the new drugs. So new ways to lessen glycemia. So we came to the point where in the last sort of 10 years, you know, we now had new drugs, maybe more than that, you know, GLP-1 receptor agonists or analogs, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, and then SGLT2 inhibitors. What I would say is that the DPP-4 inhibitors certainly lower glycemia, but they do not lower cardiovascular risk. And we've seen that in a number of outcome trials. The GLP-1 receptor agonists do lower cardiovascular risks. Um, they stimulate insulin release, they inhibit glucagon, but they also lead to weight loss because of the GLP-1 is suppressing appetite, slowing gastric emptying, um, and these help weight loss. And I'll come back to that. And you know all about that. And actually, there's bits of evidence, which I haven't put in here, which we published, that they may work in South Asians better, but I think we need more evidence of that. And then we come to the SGLT2 inhibitors, which... When they first were muted, I thought this is a silly concept because these drugs lower the renal threshold to get rid of sugar. So they make people pee out sugar at lower levels. So causing increased polyuria, which is exactly the opposite of what we've been preaching to try and do in our diabetes patients for many years. So I, plus many others thought this is daft. This is gonna cause many more infections and cause risk. 
But of course, we now know the data, and I'll show you the data. I'm sure all of you have seen the data. And the point is, these drugs work in ways that we didn't quite understand. And I think predominantly it's to do with hemodynamics. But I'm here interested to hear what Per Henrik thinks, that maybe they de-stress or put less volume or hemodynamic stress on the delicate glomerular uh, apparatus you know, of small blood vessels to prevent kidney damage, which he'll talk about. And they prevent, I think, cardiac um, remodeling by reducing stress on the, on, on, on the cardiac ventricles. So I, I think they're a bit like diuretics, but they're cleverer than diuretics in the sense, I think the way they re remove fluid from is different from diuretics and they do it in a different way. But again, Per Henrik is going to talk about that in more. But the point here is scientific humility. Don't think we know everything about diabetes and the way it connects diabetes to risk. We knew some of it, but we didn't know all of it. And I think these drugs, both these drugs have told us things new. The good thing is neither causes hypoglycemia per se. Um, they both cause weight loss, which is good, intentional weight loss, and they both lower blood pressure. These are the outcome trials. There's another one, which, I, I, is, uh, which was um, Amplitude O, which has just been published, which I had a pleasure to be involved in, but lots of other trials. Um, so five outcome trials in diabetes uh, for the SGLT2, eight um, for the GLP-1 receptor. And I will summarize the evidence top line. I'm not going to summarize the renal evidence because that would be stealing Per Henrik's thunder, and I don't want to do that. And he will he can describe it in a much greater expertise, uh, expert way than I can. So top lines, if you meta-analyze the five uh, trials in people with diabetes, with and without cardiovascular disease, majority of them did have existing ASCVD. Some of them had multiple risk factors, like Declare had a bigger proportion of multiple risk factors. But overall, 10% reduction in MACE. And if you separate this group into with and without established cardiovascular disease, that reduction was only prevalent, only seen in people with established cardiovascular disease. So the MACE benefit with SGLT2 established cardiovascular disease, and it was predominantly CVD death and, and non-fatal MI. There was no clear reduction in stroke, and I want you to remember that. If you look at heart failure hospitalization, not 10%, but wow, look at this, 33, 37 to 30 to 37%. I would say there's no difference in people with diabetes with or without ASCVD, but a 33, 30, 37 to 30% reduction in incident hospitalization for heart failure, and no difference whether or not they had ASCVD. There was also no difference in these trials whether or not the patients um, started at different glycemic levels. There was also no difference in whether the extent of glycemic reduction, so the benefits did not appear to be glucose uh, lowering per se, completely independent probably of glucose lowering. And actually, we now know that because actually when these results, when the first Emperor Egg was being presented, I remember speaking to John, uh, sorry, John McMurray by email and John McMurray quickly designed the DAPR heart failure trial um, with and without diabetes. And this is what they saw. So if you take people with existing heart failure, whether or not they had diabetes, half, roughly half had diabetes, half did not. These are people with, uh, uh, heart, with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction they saw a 26% reduction uh, over the course of 24 months in C time to CVD death, heart failure hospitalization, or urgent heart failure visit for, um, you know, so usually intravenous um, diuretic therapy. So, and the numbers needed to treat was 21. So there's almost a 5% reduction, absolute reduction. So SGL2 inhibitors also prevent heart failure hospitalization, CVD death in people with existing heart, HEFREF, whether or not they had diabetes. And they also work uh, in people with HEFPEF. Uh, again, this is a trial I was involved in. Stefan Anka was the first author, Milton Parker the last. The other two leads were, the major leads were Fire Zanad um, and Javed Butler, um, you know, um, eminent heart failure experts. And this is the first trial that showed that these drugs also benefit patients uh, who have heart failure but with preserved ejection fraction. Again, I'm not showing you the data, but the benefits were there whether or not the patients had diabetes. Again, suggesting that these drugs are benefiting cardiac remodeling in a way that's independent of glucose lowering. Again, absolute risk reduction, 3.3 numbers needed to treat 31. And, this, and the safety in both these uh, uh, the heart failure trials, all three trials was very good. The results are so good in heart failure that cardiologists and heart failure experts, and I know that some of you listening, 
uh, and I'm sure you've kept up to data, that SGL2 inhibitors have become foundational in the treatment of HEF-REF, and they probably will become foundational in the treatment of HEF-PEF. And the other benefits of these drugs beyond some of the others is that they have easy dosing and monitoring, usually one dose, 10 milligrams, uh, and monitoring. They don't cause hyperkalemia. They don't cause acute kidney injury. If anything, the ki acute kidney injury might be less. Again, Per Henrik might expand upon that. Um, you'll hear about the CKD benefits. And they also improve KCCQ. So they improve symptoms, symptomatology. And they, these are the cutoffs, two levels to which you can use these drugs. And some cardiologists, certainly my colleagues, will use SGLT2 very early, probably straight after ACE, before they add beta blocker and mRNA within the first few weeks of a new diagnosis of HEF-REF, for example. But certainly foundational in the treatment of HEF-REF. And, and the other point I didn't make in the trials is the benefits of these drugs was on top of all the other drugs in the trial. So they substantially add benefit, uh, improve patient quality, life, uh, sorry, um, symptoms. And, um, you know, they have other benefits in terms of easy monitoring, et cetera. No, I wrote this with Dan Maguire, and my sense of it was that how do these drugs work? Well, let me summarize most of the talk. When you have patients with diabetes and obesity, it doesn't need to be obesity. It's probably excess ectopic fat, really. Some of the factors from the ectopic fat that lead to dyslipidemia, hypoglycemia, by definition, hypertension, thrombotic tendency, will accelerate over time after genesis, which is why you get a doubling of MI, CVD, peripheral arterial disease and diabetes. And when you have an MI, you will damage the kidney and the heart to get, you know, to get scars and you might get ischemic damage to kidneys. But, um, and I haven't got this quite right, but with Dan, I thought, and I think we all know this, that there is a volumatic or hemodynamic or maybe a cellular and hemodynamic stress that happens at the level of the glomerulus and, and, and the heart that, that is linked to obesity and diabetes, ectopic fat, that causes stress on these organs, independent of having atherogenesis. So this is more a cardiorenal. And my guess is SGLT2s are coming in here and stopping some of this excess hemodynamic cellular stress at the glomerulus or the cardiac remodeling to stop the, the development of these things. That's how I think these things are working. What about GLP-1? Last few minutes. So GLP-1, three-point MACE, it's a meta-analysis we published this year. They reduce MACE by about 14%, 15% if you take out Elixir, because there's something, Elixir was the only non-stable uh, uh, non population, and it was a short-acting Elixir Zenitide. So 15% reduction in MACE. Um, if you look at it more, the greatest reduction is in stroke. If you take, again, Elixir out, a very consistent reduction in stroke, probably about 19% without uh, Elixir more so than MI. And if you look at overall in the meta-analysis, so overall 15% MACE minus Elixir, 50% reduction in CVD death, 12% MI, and about 19% reduction in stroke, which I think is really interesting um, overall, and no heterogeneity. Other benefits, they also benefit all-cause mortality, reduced by 13%, 12% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, so a modest reduction um, and a modest heterogeneity. And that probably is not via cardiorenal hemodynamics, it's more probably arthrogenesis. Potentially a reduction in kidney outcomes, we'll see this in flow, maybe Pera will talk about this more, but perhaps particularly also a reduction in hard kidney outcomes. Again, not to the level you see with the SGL2 inhibitors, and it may be more to do with blood pressure reduction, weight reduction, I don't quite know, but you know, a modest cardiorenal and a more consistent arthrogenesis, and particularly stroke compared to SGLT2, whereas SGLT2 are more heart and kidney, and you're going to hear about the kidney in the next talk in greater detail. Mechanisms, I'm not going to talk about, but, you know, direct and indirect, you know, the usual risk factors, maybe inflammation, maybe other factors, we can come back to that. And for that reason, SGLT2 and GLP-1 are, are in the guidelines. This is going back to the European guidelines. Treat in people with ASCVD and cardiorenal disease, and people with ASCVD, yes, think about a GLP-1 and an SGLT-2. And people with target organ damage, think about an SGLT-2 or a GLP-1 with proven benefits. And in people, you're going to hear about the CKD benefits in due course. The final thing I would say is that the benefits of these drugs are really profound. They're not only reducing risk. If you take a patient, this is a paper, again, about six years old, Here's a patient with diabetes, stroke, and an MI, for example. You know, they lose many years of life expectancy, maybe a decade. 
you have multiple new choices of intensive lipid loading, uh, novel oral anticoagulants, more intensive blood pressure, or you also have in people with diabetes, some of the new diabetes drugs. And the point here is these drugs will lower outcomes, but they also lower weight, which people, pa patients like, and blood pressure. So they have other benefits as well. And they will lower microvascular events in those we, you see glucose benefits. So you do have to consider these. And of course, they are now also recommending people with HFF, and I'll let Pera, Pera talk about the kidney disease. My final two slides then, right on time. We have new now, you know, new ways to lower cardiovascular risk. We use blood pressure, lipid lowering, hemoglobin A1C. We have ways to prevent diabetes by losing weight um, at the point of pre-diagnosis. We can reverse diabetes as we saw in direct and didami. Um, and I think that's becoming a realistic option. We're just about to uh, look at data in Pakistanis in Glasgow. We, we've done this as well in a pilot study. Um, but also in the late stage disease or medium stage disease or whatever, you have new drugs, SGL2 and GLP1, in the people with existing ASCVD or very high risk, which can further lower risk beyond all these measures, um, certainly the ones we use in established disease. So my final state, slide is this. There's good and bad news. Good news is we're better at lowering cardiovascular risk, but the bad news is more are living with diabetes. There's rising incidence, rapidly rising incidence in low and middle income countries, as you are well aware of. You're seeing it in your daily practice. That said, cheap blood pressure, lipid lowering, metformin can do very well. And people at high risk or with established disease, SGLT2 and GLP1 can lower risk, but they are currently more expensive. Hopefully the cost will come down, but certainly more cardiorenal, more anti-arthrogenic. But of course, we need greater focus on prevention and earlier diagnosis because you can only benefit people if you pick up the disease. Uh, and also emphasize that small changes can lessen risks, plus remission is possible for a small number. Uh, and we know that excess weight is the key risk factor for diabetes. I will stop there. I think we're bang on time and pass back to the chairman to, to um, introduce Per Henry. Thank you very much. Professor Per Henrik is, um, doesn't need an introduction. He's a well-known uh, uh, nef uh, nephrologist uh, working in diabetes nephrology for a long time, and he has published many, many articles, and he will be he, he is one of the most experienced person in this field, and we are very delighted to have him. So, Professor Henrik, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hussein, and also thank you, Navid, for setting the stage and also highlighting the importance of the, the kidneys, because, of course, I'm biased because I'm a nephrologist, but I do think that the kidneys play a major role when it comes to the complications of, of, of type 2 diabetes. And I hope that I will uh, convince you after this talk. But also what I will, will give you some ideas how to manage uh, the, 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 the renal risk and the cardiovascular risk in these patients. Uh, but before I start, <clears throat> these are my uh, disclosures. So the outline of the presentation, first, the few words on the prevalence of diabetic kidney disease. And this is important because diabetic kidney disease is common and the consequences are grim. So I'll, let, I'll give you some, some uh, ideas about that. And then let me give you a few words on the standard of care of, time of diabetic kidney disease. And you will see, I try to be very pragmatic because in the clinical practice, it's easy if you, come, if you remember, five finger rule, but I'll come back to that later on. And then I'll go through a few lessons from recent cardiovascular atom trials. I'm not going to address GLP-1 receptor agonists or DPP-4 inhibitors, but may, uh, maybe we can, we can address <clears throat> a little bit of what Navid was, was asking me to do. And then finally, a few words on mineral cortical receptor antagonist phenomenal. So the prevalence of diabetic kidney disease, if we go out and screen, on a global scale for the presence of diabetic kidney disease. <clears throat> so testing for the presence of albuminuria or the presence of an EGFR below 60. What you can see in the middle of this slide is that these are the ones with EGFR below 60. These are the albuminuric ones. And then we have those with both. And you can see that every second patient with type 2 diabetes at random screening 
will have or may have signs of diabetic kidney disease. And if you go to Asia, it's even up to 68%, South America, 61%. So this tells us that diabetic kidney disease is common everywhere in the world, but there are some parts that are even more common than in other parts. And this is important to take into account. Then if we know that diabetic kidneys is common, then we need to ask what are the consequences? What comes out of the diabetic kidneys? And this slide shows that if you have albuminuria, so the second column from left, uh, you have albuminuria, the third column from the left, you have an EGF far below 60 and the red column you have both and you can see that's a manifold increased risk of dying early if you have diabetic kidney disease so it comes with a shortened life expectancy but it also comes with an increased risk of cardiovascular events exactly what Navid was showing uh, in his presentation and here on the left hand side you can see that the more albumin that leaks into the urine or the less the kidneys function, the more likely the patients are to face a cardiovascular event. So kidney disease comes not only with an increased risk of dying early, but also of cardio, uh, increased risk of cardiovascular events. And you heard very nicely presented by, by Navid that heart failure is common and also come with, with, with grim consequences, but also that the newer medications actually can address this problem. But look at the left-hand side here. So when a patient with type 2 diabetes uh, uh, loses kidney function, the risk of ending up in hospital because of heart failure increases manifold. And the same is, is shown here on the right-hand side. So the more albumin that leaks into the urine, the more likely the patients are to, to uh, end up in hospital because of heart failure. So diabetic kidney disease comes with grim consequences. And I will show you uh, this uh, in this slide what the real consequences are. So they, this may be one of the most important slides in this talk. So uh, let's consider that you have a 60 year old patient with type two diabetes in your clinic. Just by having type 2 diabetes, you can expect, expect six years shorter life expectancy. And if your patient with type 2 diabetes, six year old, has suffered a myocardial infarction or a stroke in the middle here, you can expect 12 years shorter life expectancy. But look at the bottom here. If your patient with type 2 diabetes, six year old, he, ha he or she ha hasn't yet suffered myocardial infarction stroke, you can expect 16 years shorter life expectancy. So diabetic kidney disease is extremely common. And Navid was alluding to uh, the, the, the presence of, of kidney disease and this uh, of, of, of also that patients end up on dialysis. And of course, the presence of kidney disease also increases the risk of ending up on dialysis. But, but, but. We published a paper in Diabetes Care from Finland, roughly 500,000 patients uh, with type 2 diabetes from the 1960s up to 2010. 100,000 had died. And usually when I ask uh, around the world, how many of these 100,000 patients that had died had made it to dialysis? And people come up with very, very high percentages. However, However, the percentage is 0.7%. So very few of these patients end up on dialysis. They die of cardiovascular disease before that. That doesn't mean that diabetic kidneys is not common. It's the driver of the cardiovascular complications. So if you look at this heat map here, you can actually, from the colors, green is the only uh, color where uh, you don't have to worry. On the left-hand side, we have the EGFR, so the kidney function. And you go from top uh, to the bottom, you, you, you lose kidney function. And here you have albuminuria. And you can see if you don't have albuminuria and you, if you have a normal kidney function, then everything is fine. But immediately when you lose kidney function and when albumin leaks into the urine, you, you, you have an increased risk of adverse outcomes. So please, please, use in your clinic uh, uh, screening for albuminuria and also determine the EGFR or your patients. It will give you a lot of information about the prognosis of the patients. So 
What do I do in my clinic when I see patients with diabetic kidney disease? Five finger rule. Why have I done that? Because guidelines are fantastic. The problem is that colleagues uh, don't always read the guidelines. They should, but they don't. And that's the reason why I'm usually teaching that make it simple, pragmatic, five finger rule. And what are the five fingers? Here, I only present four, but I will tell you also the fifth finger. So an optimal glycemic control, A1C below seven. Navid was saying that it's not a driver, but it's the starting point. And also the, the wonderful data from, from uh, Sophie Zungas that, that Navid was showing actually tells us that if you opt for optimal glycemic control, you can actually also reduce the risk of, of kidney disease. So we should not underestimate the importance of optimal glycemic control. Optimal blood pressure control, blood pressure below 130, uh, uh, 180, we don't need to go uh, below that. But we need to have optimal bl blood pressure control. And that is also very important for the progression. Now, also the use of ACE inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers, and fourth, use of a study. But the fifth finger is, of course, stop smoking and try to achieve normal body weight, do exercise. This is the five finger rule. And if you do that and you achieve the targets, you can see here, you can actually do a lot of good for your patients. So 60% uh, risk reduction if you can actually achieve uh, more than three of the treatment targets. And what I do when I see the patients, I actually write in the, in the medical file, if we have achieved these targets, and if I have, we haven't achieved the targets, we have to take action. So it also guides how you uh, should treat your patients. But, but Navid was also saying that now we have new medications. So let me first show you a few slides about the, the, the data from the HTLT2 inhibitors. First, the cardiovascular outcome trials were designed to test that HTLT2 inhibitors are safe, that they don't cause cardiovascular disease. And the empiric outcome was the first to be reported on the 17th of September 2015, which was a day that revolutionized the treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes. By the way, if you wonder what the REG stands for, it's removal of excess glucose. And that is exactly what the HTLT2 inhibitors do, one of the uh, effects. But here you can see from this slide that in a cardiovascular trial that was not designed to look at the effects on the uh, kidney as the primary outcome, but as a secondary outcome. So a kidney outcome, uh, and, and it was... Uh, so the incident of worsening of diabetic kidney disease that was defined as progression of <clears throat> to macrobinuria or also doubling or serum creatinine. And any time you see doubling or serum creatinine, it basically means a 57% reduction in the GFR, not 50%, 57. And then uh, renal death is basically means that the patient should have been on dialysis, but they refused. But look at this slide here, a, a 39% reduced risk of a kidney outcome. Fantastic result. And on, then when we looked at the, 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 how the EGFR behaved, you can see in initially, we have, an, have a, a hemodynamically uh, uh, derived drop in the EGFR, but after that, we can preserve the kidney function in, the, in those that were exposed to empagliflozin. Those that were exposed to placebo, you can see this steady decrease or decline in the EGFR. Now, this was the first trial, but there was another trial, the CANVAS program, uh, using a slightly different kidney endpoint as a secondary outcome, a 40% reduction in EGFR, but basically similar results. So canagliflozin, another HTLT2 inhibitor, you could reduce the risk of uh, uh, a composite kidney endpoint. This was also a secondary outcome. And again, a drop, initial drop in EGFR and then preservation of kidney function. And after that, we also had uh, declared TIMI and also WERTIS. They have all showed basically the same results. But however, these are not designed to test the effect of HTLT2 inhibitors in patients with kidney disease. So it's only, they can only generate a hypothesis. So we need to test. And these tests has already been done. Two studies have been reported and one we are waiting for the results. 
credence, uh, uh, employed canagliflozin as uh, the treatment uh, on top of standard of care versus placebo. And here you can see that there was the composite, uh, composite of uh, kidney disease, doubling or serum creatinine, renal or cardiovascular. So this was the primary outcome in the, in the credence trial was, was a combined renal and cardiovascular data. At that time, uh, we nephrologists, we were not uh, uh, so keen to only use a kidney endpoint. Basically, we should have done that. I, 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 can, I can tell you later on. But we combined the renal and the cardiovascular uh, endpoints. The good news with the credence was that a 30% reduction in the risk of a primary endpoint. But if you get rid of the cardiovascular death, you only look at the kidney endpoint. You can see that the hazard ratio was even lower, so an even stronger effect on the kidneys. And this is something that you can see throughout all studies with SGLT2 inhibitors. The other trial, DAPA-CKD with dapa in again, used a slightly different uh, uh, composite endpoint, but not so much different, but, uh, but again, a comp uh, uh, combined renal and cardiovascular endpoint. But the, the result, very similar, 39% uh, uh, reduced risk. And if you get rid of cardiovascular death, only look at the kidney endpoint, stronger effect, 44%. So here we have two, two different studies, one with canagliflozin, one with dapagliflozin, showing that in patients with kidney disease, you can actually uh, uh, improve the prognosis and reduce the risk of a composite kidney endpoint. Uh, credence was done in patients with type 2 diabetes with albuminuria. Uh, DAPA-CKD was done in patients with and without diabetes. So the effects were the same in those without diabetes and in those with diabetes. Uh, then, uh, the DAPA-CKD was also done in patients with albuminuria. So we have a problem with credence and DAPA-CKD because they did not include uh, non-albuminuric patients with diabetic kidney disease. 20% of all patients in, around the world will never ever develop albuminuria, although they have, by definition, diabetic kidney disease, a reduced EGFR. And very often, the etiology behind that might be aging, hypertension, or obesity. It's not specific to diabetes, but it's called diabetic kidney disease. So the question arises, what will happen in the non-albuminuric diabetic kidney disease patients? There is one study going on, this EMPA kidney, looking at that. So let's watch out uh, uh, in a few years, maybe uh, more than one year, we can see the results also from EMPA kidney. If we compare the heat map again here, we have the credence population. The credence population is basically the ones here uh, with albuminuria and, uh, uh, and EGFR uh, from, from 90 to, to down to 30. The DAPA-CKD, uh, and also patients with albuminuria, slightly less. So we had some microalbuminuria patients too, but this area. When the EMPA kidney covers a much, much larger area. So let's watch out what happens. So HTLT2 inhibitors actually reduce the risk of a composite kidney and the risk of a composite kidney endpoint in patients with kidney disease. So I will not talk about GLP-1 receptor agonist and DPP-4 inhibitors, but I can tell you that both DPP-4 inhibitors, especially linagliptin, as shown in the Carmelina study, reduces uh, albuminuria, which is a good sign. What it means for the future, we don't know, but at least linagliptin reduces uh, albuminuria. What about GLP-1 receptor agonists? They also reduce uh, uh, albuminuria, which is good, uh, good news. Uh, they usually, in the studies, what we have seen, they don't reduce the risk of hard kidney endpoints. And we can talk about that in, in, the, in the discussion. There is a reason for it. However, let me finally say a few words on phenerenone and mineral cortical receptor again, antagonist. So this is a new way of treating patients with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease. So if HDLT2 inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors, they, they, they control the, 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 or they 
they, they target the hemodynamic effects. And then we also have the metabolic effects, which also SGLT2 inhibitors address, GLP-1 receptor agonists, DPP-4 inhibitors, et cetera, et cetera. But we also have an inflammatory pathway. So when you have, a, when you have damage to the kidneys, then you will have uh, uh, fibrosis, fibrosis, inflammation that leads to fibrosis. And uh, uh, aldosterone is very important in, 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 this, uh, in this case. Now, there are two trials with phenomenon, the Fidelio DKD, which is a kidney outcomes trial, and Figaro, a cardiovascular outcome trial. Basically means if you look at the heat map here on the left-hand side, Fidelio includes patients with, with, with more severe kidney disease, while Figaro also those with less severe kidney disease. And if you then look at the Fidelio again, you can see that 90% had uh, an EGFR here, from here down to, uh, to, to, to 20, and here you can see that 10% of them had microbinuria. Uh, Figaro, you can see it more than 60% had actually EGFR above 60, but they had micro or macrobinuria. So let's see what we could achieve with an MRA uh, in these patients. So in the Fidelio, those with kidney disease on top of the tolerated uh, RAS blockade, phenernone actually reduced the, 40, the more than 40% uh, uh, EGFR kidney composite by 18%. So this means that you have uh, more than 40% decrease, sustained decrease in EGFR, or uh, ending up on dialysis, kidney failure, or renal death. And that basically means that the patient should be on dialysis, but they refuse. And you can see wonderful result again, 18%. Now, some people may say, oh, this is much less than you see in SGLT2 inhibitors. They're different absolutely different populations. If you then try to make them very similar, then the results also become, after the extrapolation becomes very similar. But the good news is here that yet another drug that can improve kidney prognosis and also, uh, also improve the cardiovascular uh, prognosis, you can see. So uh, uh, key secondary cardiovascular control uh, outcome by 14% uh, reduction. Uh, what about then Fidelio? That was a cardiovascular, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, 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 the Figaro. So here we can see that the, in, the, in the Figaro, uh, on the left-hand side here, uh, again, there we had a 40% decrease in the EGFR, renal death of kidney, kidney failure. And here you can see that down by 13%, but this was not significant. But these patients were less sick than in the Fidelio. And right hand side, if you then change the, the, the endpoint or the outcome to a sustained 57% decrease, which basically means uh, doubling or zinc creatinine is significant. But this is, of course, uh, uh, an extrapolation of the data. But it just tells us that uh, it seems that uh, these medications work also in those with less severe kidney disease, but uh, definitely in those with uh, severe kidney disease. And then if you look at the, the risk of ending up on dialysis, also in the, in the Figaro, it's uh, reduced, the risk is reduced. And then if you put these two trials together, F Figaro and, F and, and, and the Fidelio, and using the doubling or serum creatinine, so the 57% EGFR kidney, uh, uh, the decrease in EGFR, you can see 23% uh, reduction. So very, very good news. So ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, a few take home messages from this. Diabetic kidney is common, consequence are grim, so we need to take action. The novel SGLT2 inhibitors and the MRI phenomenon provide effective tools to improve the prognosis of patients with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease due to their cardioprotective and renoprotective effects. So now it's time for action. Screen, screen for the presence of diabetic kidney disease. Implement the therapy. Don't forget the five-finger rule. That's the standard of care. And after that, you can also consider the newer medications because we can do a lot more uh, for the benefit of our patients. That said, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I hand over to Professor Hussein again. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Henrik. So it's, uh, it was an impressive talk. 
And now we'll be asking uh, Professor uh, Kamlesh Kunti. Uh, he's a professor of primary care diabetes at the University of Leicester. And uh, he's also the co-director uh, for the Leicester Diabetes Center. And he has published a large number of uh, uh, articles. And uh, he's a diabetologist and as an academician, this is a, uh, and he has supervised many PhD students as I can see. And um, and uh, so so it's a it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Professor Kunti, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Akhtar. Uh, thank you very much to IDF for giving me the opportunity to present today, and also for Naveed and Per Hendrik for setting the scene. Uh, great presentations with really great evidence-based data. So my uh, task is to uh, go to the Kadaigo Diabetes Management and CKD guidelines. Before I start on my presentation, uh, this is just to uh, note for the colleagues who are listening, can you please keep your questions coming in? Uh, we've got quite a, a lot of time for questions. We're here to help uh, in terms of your clinical practice, so please do keep them coming. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Um, I'd like to thank the whole working group for this uh, CKD uh, diabetes guidelines, particularly the co-chairs Ian DeBoer and Peter Rossing. It was great fun being uh, part of these guidelines. All these slides are available on the website, Kadaigo website. So please don't, you don't need to make notes. There's uh, over 80 uh, slides there with download. And these are slides from uh, the, the website. So in terms of the scope of the guidelines, this was for type one and type two diabetes, uh, all stages of uh, uh, chronic kidney disease were looked at, including uh, kidney transplant recipients. Um, it was a very holistic approach to looking at the data and we considered randomized controlled trials mainly, uh, looking at lifestyles, pharmacotherapy and systems. Um, I'll touch on pharmacotherapy, which has already been alluded to very well by uh, Naveed and uh, for Henrik. We excluded intervention that only covered blood pressure or lipids, which are in other Kadaigo guidelines. Uh, we excluded prevention and screening, which has again been covered previously, and where there wasn't enough data as well. These are the chapters, the way uh, the guidelines have been formatted, and as I said, I'll go through some of these chapters. The key issue, just like management of any aspect of person with chronic condition, is putting the person with the disease at the center. So this is a person with diabetes at the center of care and empowering them to manage their care. Um, literature searches were updated up to 2020 in February. Uh, randomized control trials were looked at. Uh, overall observational studies were also looked at. Uh, but very few observation studies and a few reviews. And overall, we looked at 244 randomized controlled trials with over 150,000 participants, 31 observation studies, and 50 reviews. We looked at comprehensive care in people with diabetes. Um, there should be a comprehensive strategy, as I mentioned, about lifestyle, about pharmacotherapy, uh, and other protective therapies. Um, so if you look at this uh, pyramid, uh, for all patients, we have to manage glycemic control, blood pressure control, lipid management, which again has uh, been alluded to already. Uh, lifestyle in terms of exercise, nutrition, and smoking cessation. Most patients should get SGLT2 inhibitors and brass blockers. And we've talked about uh, GLP-1 receptor and phenylalanine, which I won't uh, go into. And some patients may need antiplatelet therapies as well. In terms of uh, comprehensive care, everyone uh, should be treated with uh, RAS blockers, ACE inhibitors, or antitrypsin receptor blockers. In people with diabetes, hypertension, and albuminuria, and these should be titrated to the highest approved dose that is tolerable with the patient. Uh, for patients with uh, diabetes, albuminuria, and normal blood pressure treatment with ACE inhibitor or ARB may still be considered. Um, monitor for changes in blood pressure, serum creatinine, and potassium within two to four weeks of initiation. Now, this is really, really important because a lot of patients are left to go. They started on a, a combination of, uh, you know, when, when you diagnose them, they started with lipid lowering therapy, 
glycemic control and with RAS blockades. And sometimes people are looked at three months because they think that's when the HP onset is going to be checked. But it's very important that we look at two, and, and normally routinely we look at two weeks uh, once we've initiated ACE inhibitor uh, or ARB. And then when we up titrate uh, again to check this. And continue ACE and ARB therapy unless the um, keratinine rises by more than 30% within the four weeks following initiation of treatment or an increase in dose. And the important thing is these uh, therapies are teratogenic, so advise contraceptive uh, 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 advice to women who are receiving these and discontinue in women who are considering pregnancy or who become pregnant. These are all very simple. You may know this, but uh, our uh, uh, audience today is mainly uh, primary care practitioners. I'm a general practitioner myself. And these are quite bread and butter things that uh, we really ought to be doing in our clinical practice. Um, smoking cessation, there is a, a huge amount of uh, data showing smoking cessation does benefit people with diabetes and um, CKD. Glycemic monitoring. Um, this we can discuss in the uh, our, uh, discussions later on, but overall uh, HbA1c should be checked at least uh, once a year, in most patients twice a year, but if we're titrating glycemic therapies then we should be checking uh, four times a year. Now people who have CKD, again uh, there's a nice algorithm and nice uh, uh, um, uh, graph that you can find in the, some of the Kirigo guidelines that if people have severe end of the kidney disease, uh, CKD uh, five, four, then you may need to monitor three or four times a year uh, in terms of their EGFR. But this is for glycemic control. Now, the other issue is that glycemic control, the precision of HbA1c declines with advancing CKD at uh, stage four and stage five, especially people who are on dialysis. Um, and in this case, the recommendations are that you may want to look a glucose management indicator, and uh, most CGM devices are uh, automatically uh, producing this uh, because it gives you a more accurate result. The frequency of HbA1c measurements, people with uh, CKD uh, 1 to G3b, uh, twice per year, up to four times if we're changing. The reliability for HbA1c measurement is good. Uh, for CKD 4 and 5, twice per year, at least four times a year when we change the target. And uh, maybe here we should be considering uh, glucose management indicators. We've seen lots of data uh, on glycemic management to, from uh, Henry and Naveed, but just to summarize, uh, BCCT in people with type one, there was about 50 to 76 percent reduction for microvascular complications with HbA1c 7% compared to 9%. With UKPDS 25% reduction, uh, comparing people in the intervention group who achieved 7% versus the control group with 7.9%. And the greatest benefit is when we have the highest HbA1c, and it's always easier to achieve a large reduction when the baseline HbA1c is high. Um, in, ter in terms of macrovascular complications, Navi's gone through this, and most of the data is showing that if we go early in the disease trajectory, like UKPDS, we may have macrovascular benefits, but if it's later down the line, uh, we may not have uh, macrovascular benefits with glycemic control. Um, in terms of harms, there are harms with glucose lowering medications that we need to think about, particularly when we are considering sulfonylureas and insulins in patients who have CKD because the risk of hypoglycemia are higher in these populations. So um, if they are on um, therapies that may cause hypoglycemia, then one needs to give educational support to prevent hypoglycemia um, and how to manage hypoglycemia. Um, global studies that we've done and other of them show that about 20% of people are not aware what uh, hypoglycemia is. And that's not because they have unawareness. These are early in the disease trajectory, but they just don't know what hypoglycemia is. So people who are on insulin, sulfonylureas, or metaglinides, then we need to uh, think about using either self-monitoring blood glucose or CGM because the risk of hypoglycemia is high. 
other therapies we've talked about today, particularly SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor acnes, the risk are low unless they're being used with uh, the insulins and saponylureas, in which case you may not to want to do as much uh, self-monitoring of blood glucose. And again, uh, it all depends on affordability. We need to individualize targets, just like uh, every other patient uh, with diabetes. So um, going for tight targets, uh, if there is early CKD, uh, CKD1, there are no microvascular complications, comorbidities, there's not many life expectancy as high. Um, we saw data from Nui showing, you know, if you're 40, then you've got uh, six years of life years lost, uh, looking at the emerging risk factor collaboration. But if you're 75, 80, you may only have one year of life year to gain, uh, possibly with uh, tighter glycemic control. People who are hypoglycemic aware, uh, we need, can go for a tighter target. Resources obviously uh, are important as well. Uh, but CKD5, for example, is, as we're talking about CKD, then um, we may go for a looser target of around 8%. Lifestyle interventions in patients, people with diabetes um, should consume a high uh, diet in high vegetables, fruits, whole grain fiber, legumes, plant-based protein, unsaturated fats and nuts, and lower in processed meats, refined carbohydrates, and sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, there is also recommendation on maintaining a protein intake of 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day. For those with diabetes on non-dialysis CKD, this is uh, uh, all in the in the guidelines, and it also gives you nice uh, infographics of kind of diets, plant proteins and animal proteins, and how much protein uh, per ounce or per gram that you would get uh, from these uh, uh, nutritious uh, products. There's also recommendations, really simple advice that you can give. These are kind of things that you can give infographics. You can cut this out and give it to the patients of how people can reduce their salt intake. Uh, and simple things like buying fresh foods, cooking at home, keeping un healthy, unsalted snacks on hand. Um, the one I really like is, you know, a lot of people are eating out, is that when we ask for our sources, ask them not to put the sauce on the food and ask to get it on the side so that you can use as much as you can or, or less as you can. So quite simple graphics that we can give to patients as well. Um, exercise, uh, really, really important. Uh, recommendations are that 150 minutes per week should be given to these patients. Now, there are no specific randomized controlled trials in people with CKD in looking at the amount of exercise, but this is a generic advice of 150 minutes of uh, exercise, moderate intense physical activity per week. But uh, there is good data, similar studies to emerging risk factor. Uh, Yogini from our group just did that. That if you have um, uh, multimorbidity uh, and CKD is a multimorbid condition, if people are taking the uh, recommended amount of exercise, then you could gain four years of life just with exercise when they have, people have multimorbidity. So. Uh, and that's the age of around 40. So it's really important to emphasize exercise and also the other benefits that people will get uh, in, in such as mental health improvements as well. Um, the therapies uh, are not going on to detail because they, they've been looked at. Uh, this is just a summary of the cardiovascular effects and kidney effects, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, we do see arthrosclerotic cardiovascular events reductions. We see heart failure improvements, albuminuria uh, or albuminuria containing composite outcomes, and EGFR loss improved with SGLT2 inhibitors. GLP-1 receptor acnes, uh, cardiovascular benefits, no heart failure benefits, um, some benefits on albuminuria and uh, uh, GFR, and DPP-4 inhibitors, no benefits on arthrosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, no benefits in heart failure with one particular DPP-4 inhibitor. There is increased heart failure risk, uh, and there is some data showing uh, slight improvements in albuminuria. On the right-hand side, the key side effects. I think SGLT2 inhibitors we're seeing are, are really becoming standard, standard therapy because the number of side effects you get, adverse events, is very low. Genetic mycotic infections is the main one. Easily... Uh, uh, 
um, managed to, we, when we start them in primary care, we tell them that they may get genetic myopathy infections and just go to a chemist and get antifungal creams. Diabetic ketoacidosis, the risk is very, very low. And obviously there is uh, some data for kind of closing uh, in terms of uh, amputations. GLP-1 receptor acne is mainly uh, gastrointestinal uh, side effects with vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and nausea. As I mentioned, dp 4 inhibitors, um, HbA1c reductions are modest uh, and very safe. We can use them in elderly, we can use them in frail uh, participants, um, but saxagliptin, uh, where the, there was a risk of heart failure. Um, cardiovascular outcome trials, not going into detail here at all, but we've seen the data for SGL2 inhibitors in terms of cardiovascular events, uh, decrease in micromnia, decline in EGFR and end stage uh, kidney disease. And, and these are the meta analysis. This is the meta analysis that we had at the time of uh, the guidelines. We've had uh, uh, more data um, from M, um, MPEG closing with the uh, um, the Vertis trial, uh, sorry, Arte Group goes in with the Vertis trial, um, but you get similar uh, rates of decline. GLP-1 receptor agonist, Navid's covered this uh, extremely well. And again, what we see is there are some benefits in terms of kidney disease outcomes, both for worsening kidney function and composite kidney outcomes, including macro or muria. So how do we start? We uh, give advice, lifestyle advice for newly diagnosed patients. We start with metformin and an SGL2 inhibitor if they have uh, CKD. This is uh, the first line therapy that's been recommended in the CADIGO guidelines. I'll come to the metformin in terms of EGFR. The SGL2 EGFR are changing. They've gone down to uh, 20 for um, heart failure, 25 for certain heart failure and, and CKD as well. Um, then we go to GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is a preferred option after metformin SGLT2 inhibitor, and then all the other therapies, uh, depending on uh, what amount of glycemic reductions one requires. Metformin, again, uh, I think this is great uh, uh, algorithm for primary care. Um, we use this quite a lot for GPs, uh, ask them to laminate this. EGFR uh, of uh, less than 30, we shouldn't be using uh, metformin, and if they're on metformin, they should be stopping. If EGFR is greater than 60, then we can start on 500 and gradually increase because of the tolerability, uh, uh, particularly of nausea and, and diarrhea. We tail back if there are side effects. If uh, EGFR is 30 to 44, then we initiate half the dose and titrate it upwards to half of maximum dose. Normally, we, we go to two grams if the EGFR is uh, uh, up to uh, 60. Anything uh, 30 to 44, we usually go half the dose. And uh, in terms of uh, monitoring B12, uh, recommendations are that if um, people have been on metformin for more than four years, then we should check B12 on an annual basis, unless patients are at risk of uh, B12 deficiency, for example, diet. Uh, if they're vegetarians, et cetera. Um, and kidney function at least annually in people who have EGFR greater than 60. Um, but if uh, it's uh, below 60, then um, at least uh, twice a year. Um, structured self-management education programs, there is really good randomized control trial evidence that shows it improves knowledge, belief, skills, improves self-management, self-motivation, encourages adoption of healthy lifestyle, improves risk markers, improves uh, uh, adherence, uh, improves uh, screening for the key uh, risk factors that we screen for on a regular basis, um, reduces uh, uh, diabetes-related complications or better managed, but overall their emotional well-being and general satisfaction and quality of life are improved. Um, there's good data on chronic care models. So chronic care model, uh, this is one of the models where one would have a, a number of systems, community uh, resources, uh, CKD health system. This is self-management support, delivery system, support the healthcare professionals having clinical information systems and decision support, a 
proactive multidisciplinary team. And when we give advice and educational input, self-management program is an activated patient who works with the, the multidisciplinary team, uh, which leads to improved outcomes. And team-based integrated care is supported by decision makers. This is look, we're looking even more wider than the healthcare team. Um, should be delivered by physicians and non-physicians. There's some excellent data coming from low middle income countries, some fantastic randomized control trials, the CAR study, for example, in India, showing that trained nurses, trained healthcare assistants, community workers, they can help improve outcomes for people uh, with diabetes. Um, you need a register, uh, a risk assessment. You need to empower the patients, risk stratify patients, uh, depending on their risk factors and manage those risk factors, have a coordinated care program, review the risk factors on a, on a regular basis, reinforce the, the recall system, uh, and then goals are multiple targets with both Naveed and uh, Henry have talked about multiple risk factors, use of all the protective therapies, and ongoing support to promote self-care. So overall summary of these guidelines, uh, you know, we need to have comprehensive care management, glycemic monitoring targets, lifestyle interventions, antihypoglycemic therapies, uh, which have the evidence base uh, and uh, other approaches to managing these patients. Patients sent decision-making support uh, with the, the chronic care model, talked about lifestyle, uh, diet and exercise. HbA1c, um, again, uh, individualizing it for that patient uh, and, in terms of the therapies, we talked about metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor, ICNIS, and Per Henrik's talked about phenylalanine, as well as the standard therapies of RAS inhibitors. Thank you very much for listening. Please do keep the questions coming. Um, so if we can hold, have the panel, please. Right, uh, we have some uh, questions coming up. Um, and I'm happy for any of you to, to take them. Um, so first one, is spironolactone beneficial for DKD? Uh, it's a cardiologist from Indonesia. Per Henrik, um, Naveed? Uh, yeah, that's a good, uh, good question. And, and uh, <clears throat> yes, they are. And there are data uh, from, from Denmark, small studies. We need to keep that in mind. The problem with spironolactone is that the risk of, of hyperkalemia. And that's the reason why they, they have not been uh, a drug of choice in those with DKD. The reason why minifinerenone, uh, you know, studies on that is actually, uh, it's less, it's causing less uh, uh, hyperkalemia. Although there is also an attached risk of, 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 of hyperkalemia in these patients, we need to keep in mind that. And the reason is, uh, Easy aldosterone that is secreted from the zona glomerulosa in the adrenals works on the collecting ducts and the distal tubules. And what do they do? Aldosterone works on the mineral cortical receptor. Uh, and what does it do? It actually retains sodium and get rid of potassium. And of course, if you if you block that, what will happen is that you actually will retain uh, uh, potassium. So uh, they are, actually they are because of the effects that I've showed you in the Fidelio and the Figaro, uh, mineral cortical receptor antagonists are beneficial in terms of the kidney disease. But uh, the reason why we should favor phenolone on instead of, of, of uh, spironolactone is the risk of hyper, hyperkalemia. However, you should always be vigilant when it comes to potential uh, potential uh, adverse effects and hyperkalemia is one. Great, thanks very much. Um, Naveed, I don't know if you want to take this one, the EGFR threshold for use of semaglutide from cardiologists, maybe just a, a, a for GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, so I don't actually know, I think, I think it's around about 50, um, but I know that the semaglutide trial for flu which is testing in kidney population is, is, is uh, starting at 25 to, to 75 with various albuminuria criteria. And we need more data from that, you know, in terms of does it have a cardiovascular, does it have a renal benefit? Um, so there are some data now coming forward from individual trials that um, other than the cardiovascular benefits that the GLP-1 receptor agonists, some of them may slow 
kidney damage, hard kidney outcomes, but I think we need more data from dedicated trials yeah. like flu and yeah. I think age, age of yeah. primary care, we tend to go for 15 um, yeah. primary. Can I add to that? You know, so the EGF, I, I, I think that basically GLP-1 receptor antagonist, you can go quite low. The problem is that you need to have more, you, you tend to have more nausea. That's the, so it's, it's, that's, the, that's the problem. But there's no danger danger of going down that's important of course to, to to understand but let me navid you asked during your talk me to explain a little bit about the uh, the 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 uh, mechanisms of slt2 uh, uh, antagonists and, and and inhibitors and also the glp1 uh, receptor antagonist uh, uh, GLP, uh, STLT2s, what they do, they block the sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. So sodium uh, uh, is basically more sodium is reaching the macula densa next to the glomerulus. The glomerulus works as a control tower of the glomerulus. So that it's, it's and what does it do? If you, it actually, when sodium reaches the macula densa, small amounts are, are absorbed. You need energy, so you go from ATP to ADP, and you generate adenosine, which is a very strong vasoconstrictor of the afferent arteriole. So you, you reduce the perfusion and the intraglomer pressure that is usually increased in patients with diabetes, hypertension, uh, obese patients. So you actually you, you reduce the tone of the afferent arteriole. Now, interesting is enough is that the sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule, 90% of the, the oxygen consumption in the kidneys is due to the, the sodium reabsorption. So in diabetes or in hypertension or in obesity, when you have hyperfiltration, you push the sodium handling in the proximal tubule and you def basically you consume oxygen and you actually induce kidney hypoxia. And we know from experimental animal data that if you induce kidney hypoxia, you will get proteinuria, you will get kidney inflammation, you will get uh, damage. Now, why do I uh, give this long explanation? STL, uh, GLP-1 receptor antagonists, they work on the most oxygen consuming transporter in the proximal tubule, the sodium hydrogen. Why don't we see this fantastic effects on the hard kidney endpoints. There is a reason. They do deliver sodium to macula densa, but they also have another effect. They cause vasodilation. So you mitigate the increased tone by causing vasodilation. But, but Navi was absolutely right. Uh, the LEAD trial, when you extrapolate or go, you, you look at lower EGFR levels, it seems that there might benefit. So let's keep our fingers crossed and hope that this will in the future also show to be, be, be beneficial in terms of the hard kidney endpoints. But what we can say at the moment, HTLT2 inhibitors reduce albuminuria, they also reduce the risk of hard kidney outcomes. GLPM receptor agonists, they reduce albuminuria, full stop. They might have, we don't know, but they might have some, beneficial effects on the heart kidney endpoint. DPP-4 inhibitors, at least linagliptin reduces uh, uh, albuminuria, but they don't have any effects on the heart kidney endpoint. And that is not unexpected either. They are also natriuretic, the DPP-4s, in the same way as uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and, 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 and GLP receptor antagonists. But they work beyond macula densa on the distal tubule. So I would say that all the effects we see are, are you know, they are expected. And the good news here is that uh, we have means to actually uh, address what's going on in the kidneys in different ways. And that's the good news. Sorry Thanks. for this long explanation. No, no. Um, uh Akta, can I, can I ask a, a question to you? You know, this is an IDF uh, platform. Lots of people from low, middle income countries. We're talking about expensive therapies here, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, affordability is a problem. What are the key things that one would do where there is uh, inadequate resources? 
here. So, what kind uh, of things do we do for I, CKD patients? Uh, thank you, Kamlesh. It's, uh, it's a very important issue, as I know that uh, you, we know we both come from the um, uh, from a poor country, or um, uh, so we 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 uh, we think in a in a different way. Actually, what we are doing so so yes, you can see that IDF uh, actually promoted uh, well, with WHO to include the SGL2 to be included in the essential medical drugs. So we are doing it. So so Excellent. that's what we did. But having said it, so for example, I am taking an initiative to review our guidelines. And this is one of the things that we cannot deny the model, even though it's expensive, the science, but probably we should also include the best alternatives in case the patient cannot afford it. So that would be the option. So I think we'll have to go by science, but at the same time, we try to give a kind of best alternative because we know that many people will not be able to at this, uh, at least as as the prices are, so they will not be able to afford these uh, expensive drugs. Thanks Professor so Hussain, can I can I add, add to that? Sorry, sorry, Kamlesh. I think also what I try to say in my talk is that we need also to uh, to uh, highlight that standard of care is a very efficient treatment. The problem is that if you if you Ask the question, how many around the globe have not been tested for the presence of pneumonia or EGFR? It's horrible. In my country, developed country, Finland, 25% of patients with type 2 diabetes have never been, have never been tested for the, the presence of albinuria. It's absolutely horrible. So first, what we need to do, screen, screen, screen for the presence of kidney disease, and then take action. And the five-finger rule is the standard of care. And as I showed, you can achieve a lot. But of course, if you have the economic resources, an SGLT2 inhibitor would be an absolutely fantastic, fantastic uh, add-on to that. But first of all, we need to find the patients at risk and we need to take action. And that is the five-finger rule. I, I think that's a really simple message, uh, Fenrik. Uh, you know, uh, we, we talk about legacy benefits of glycemic control, but there's legacy benefits of glycemic control, there's legacy benefits of blood pressure control, legacy benefits of lipid control, and from sure. steno to legacy benefits of all three risk factors controlled very, very early on. Um, yeah, come on. Yeah, sorry, I was going to just say, uh, no, listening to both of you sp to speak reminded me, and I've heard this a few times now, um, and linked to what Per Henrik says, obviously picking up kidney disease, you have to do the right test, but also um, I guess there's a big initiative just to try and pick up diabetes at the point, you know, sooner as well. Um, and the other things I think we've underestimated is important perhaps of salt intake, um, physical activity, which I think is an issue in sure. all, many parts of the world, trying to get people to, be, to understand that physical activity helps keep their blood pressure down, helps protect their kidneys and hearts in a ways that perhaps are just as good as drugs, if not better than drugs and trying to get them to have sustained physical activity. And I, I just don't think those messages have been well communicated by us uh, as physicians, but we probably do need to do better. So even simple changes people can make can have substantial benefits. And I think you nicely emphasize that. Um, you know, uh, we have published the data on this issue of, clear, of, of exercise, but that's type one, not in type two. So, but I think we can extrapolate. So. Uh, the lack of uh, intensive, I, I, I iterate, intensive physical activity is a risk factor for diabetic kidney disease. So, and also for retinopathy. So it basically means that if you do some, some exercise, you actually also reduce the risk of, 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 of kidney disease. But it's very inter interesting. The reason why it might be so, um, you know, um, the, 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 if, uh, if we go up to the Andes, you and me and Kamish and, and Professor Jose, what will happen? Will we potentially have a mountain sickness? What is a mountain sickness? It's an increased uh, you know, pulse and a re re reduced battery reflex sensitivity. And actually, uh, what the exercise does is that you improve sensitivity that's what, what what you do and and actually what i'm saying here is that we have this data on it seems that if you have diabetes you have a, a reduced by reflex sensitivity and we know from the clinic they have a slightly higher pulse and the best way 
or treating that is basic to do to to do uh, some exercise. So, and this doesn't mean that you need to to run a marathon or anything like that. It just needs that you have to be physical active and sweat, but you don't have to run. Just phys be physical active and sweat, and you can get a lot of benefits. So now there's a lot of things that we can do even without using the expensive medications. Thank you. We've, we've got a few minutes. I've got three or four questions to finish. Maybe we'll take quick uh, question and answer sessions here. Um, endocrinologist from Bangladesh, uh, what about dapagliflozin and CKD? I think in terms of EGFR cut points there. Um, any of you? No, uh, no. Uh, uh, basically, you know, the DAPA CKD, DAPA HF studies uh, uh, used DAPA, <clears throat> DAPA glyphosin down to 20. Now, is it a danger below that? No, it's not. The reason is, oh, I'm saying this, there's no, in, in any of these studies, an increased risk of acute kidney injury when you go down, because that has been the, 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 the actually the, the, the concern. That has not been shown the opposite to actually reduce the risk. So, but uh, uh, what we can say that DAPA HF, DAPA CKD down to 20. And then, of course, that's, that's definitely shown in, 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 um, in studies. Thanks very much, Manry. Naveed, maybe for you here, uh, uh, endocrinologist from Pakistan, evidence based medicine is a tovastatin better in CKD than rosuvastatin? Uh, better for what is the question. So, yeah. um, you know, th the reality is they're both very good drugs. They both lower cholesterol very aggressively and they also lower triglycerides. I certainly have stopped using simvastatin. I'm using a lot more Atova and Rosuva. Um, um, I think Per Henrik said the point of dialysis, you know, there's no clear evidence of benefit, but certainly out with that, you know, both are good drugs. Um, so, I mean, I think the only thing is in uh, the Rosuvastatin, uh, 40 shouldn't be used in Pakistanis. Uh, you know, uh, or South Asians, um, yeah. because yeah, but that's that's. Yeah. Can I can I add to that? I think Navid, that the reason for the question, I might be wrong, but uh, the reason for the question is that there are some data showing that there is an area with the use of rosuvastatin. I think that's that might be the the, but it's very small. It's very yeah. small, but uh, also favor like you do, Navid, atorvastatin uh, or rosuvastatin in, in, in the patients. Eddie. Okay, there's a there's a, a quite a nice um, uh, practical question. Um, how aggressive should one be when CKD, when we're at CKD stage four and five, um, when do you need to stop SGLT2? Um, would, would you stop SGLT2s at, if there's a decline uh, in EGFR slopes? That was a question for me, yeah. Per Henrik, so you, <laughs> to you, actually. Let me, the brief answer is, I'm always being concerned by my, from, from uh, what, how my, my fellow nephrologists, when they start to, to you know, stop ACE inhibitors and receptor blockers, because when you do that, then actually the, the disease is going to, 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 uh, uh, to progress even further. We need to be, of course, aware that there is a risk of acute kidney injury. But so for me, I'm trying to be aggressive until I can't achieve anything else. But it means that you, we should not leave our minds, we should leave our minds open, but not so open that our brains fall out. So we need to be, of course, we need to know what we are doing. But of course, the, with these medications, we can retard the progression. And as HTLT2 inhibitors, uh, there is no increase if you've got acute kidney injury. With, with ACE inhibitors and receptor, uh, uh, there might be small increased risk. But again, if you take out the uh, dr drugs out, then you also cause damage. Okay. So uh, the answer is, I think you should be aggressive. Okay, thank you. I think we're in view of time. Actually, I'm gonna hand over to you shortly to close if that's okay. But uh, there's a nice uh, uh, comment here from Endo in Saudi, Prof KK, how can we as physicians practice what we preach? Changing our lifestyle first, good question. I must say the, uh, the uh, pandemic certainly helped me because we're, 
all of us here are not traveling as much. So walking to home, walking to work every day has been great. So I've, I've gone past my 150 minutes per week on a weekly basis. And it's purely due to the pandemic. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. We'll leave it on that note uh, and we'll pass you out to our chair again. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the audience of today that who uh, made up uh, made their times free on a Saturday uh, to be with us during a busy uh, weekend and listen the end and the interact with our experts. I want to express my heartful thanks to Professor Sattar, Professor Group, and Professor Kunti. Many thanks for your excellent uh, presentations and the question and answer session. I'm convinced that our audience today was able to deepen or update its knowledge on the management of cardiovascular disease and the renal risk in type two diabetes. A message to our audience is that as soon as the live session is over, you will receive an email to submit your feedback about today's event. Once submitted, the IDF team will send you a certificate of attendance per email so that you can download it and print it according to your preferences. At the end, I would also uh, like to congratulate our team that who has so effectively campaigned for this, uh, for this important uh, session that we actually, we had more than 1600 people that who actually registered and 423 were present alive from 74 countries. So it's a, it's a very good uh, reach. And I would also like to thank the sponsor for this, uh, the AstraZeneca who has sponsored this uh, webinar. And with these words, I would like to thank you all. And I wish you all a very great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Keep well, everyone. <laughs>